it's time for Perspective on the programme. And by reading his website, I can tell you that my guest today is a man who, in his personal life, tends to an orchard of more than 100 different varieties of apple. He spends time breeding and selecting grass pea. He has a small herd of rare breed red pole cattle and a flock of buckeye chickens. Ecology, food and farming, obviously, in his blood. Kerry Fowler is also the US government's special envoy for global food security, and he holds a series of other notable job titles and has won as well a series of uh, awards. He's also author of the book Shattering Food Politics and the Loss of Genetic Diversity. And he joins me here on set. Thanks very much for coming in and talking to us. I mean, so many um, different job titles, so many to mention as well, all those awards that you've won. But you're here in Paris, aren't you, for talks on VAX. Now, that is the vision for adapted crops and soils. Tell us exactly what it is. Sure. Well, the, the premise of VAX, the vision for adapted crops and soils, is that if you're going to um, try to strengthen or to have food security globally, uh, it has to be based on good, fertile, healthy soils, and it has to be based on adapted crops, adapted to the environment, to the social and economic situation, adapted to the climate. And sometimes we overlook those fundamentals, that you really need good soil and you need good crops. So what we've done in the first instance is to focus on the needs of Africa. Africa will be the largest populated continent on Earth by the end of the century. It's where presently the, the greatest uh, number of food insecure people live. Um, and the ironic thing is that most of the staple crops in Africa are actually imported crops. They didn't originate. They weren't domesticated in Africa. And yet there are more than 300 indigenous crops in Africa already embedded in the culture, and you could even say embedded in the climate and the environment. Um, so we are focusing attention on trying to improve the productivity of those indigenous crops and also deal with the really serious problems of, of soil health and fertility in Africa. Africa has, uh, frankly, some of the poorest, most degraded soils in, in the world. So why are African farmers not already thinking along those lines? Or are they thinking along the lines that it's not quick enough? Well, they, they are thinking along those lines. And in fact, the African Union has highlighted these particular issues and said that there's been massive underinvestment in their own indigenous crops. But what's happened is that, that, that the crops that are, that are today predominant in Africa are the crops, frankly, that we in North America and Europe have been growing for uh, many, many years. And we've put a lot of investment in it, billions of dollars worth of investment in, in uh, upping the productivity level of those crops. And currently, they, they simply outcompete in the marketplace in, in terms of yield, um, the more traditional crops. So we can balance that. And I, I think one of the most important things about engaging in this effort is that those African traditional crops are in fact highly nutritious. So if the goal of a food system is really to feed people properly and to ensure their good nutrition, then we need to be looking at the crops that can provide that. And why have you come to France to talk about it? Well, I'm going all over the world to, to talk about it. Uh, a French uh, system has a, has a great research system They've been involved with uh, African uh, development, African crops for many years. And we're uh, seeking um, the support of, of governments in Europe and elsewhere for this type of initiative, which really aims at changing the conversation, changing the discourse, and getting back to basics. Of course, the big elephant in the room while you're talking about all of this, I assume, is climate change, because presumably all these problems you're talking about are just going to get worse and worse. Yes, that's right. Well, last year was the warmest year on record uh, ever. And I think that uh, this month will be, I believe I'm correct in saying, the 539th consecutive month in which the global average temperature for the month exceeded the 20th century average for that month. So what I think we, many of us are in danger of doing is underestimating the effect of climate change on agricultural production. It affects all of our crops at all points in the growing season and all parts of the plant. So all of these are going to have to be modified, if you will, uh, bred for the different kinds of climates that we have. And um, getting back to Africa, many of the uh, crops that predominate now, such as maize, um, we think will actually decline in yield by 2050 because of the effects of climate change. And we need to take that into account. 
You talked um, at the beginning there about the kind of crops that are being planted, but is it about modifying, uh, you know, internally those, those crops, those seeds as well, to make them grow in different ways? Well, I'm not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not talking about genetic modification or GMOs, as people uh, term them, but through traditional plant breeding methods, um, those crops are being selected for, either by farmers or scientists right now, but we need to step up those kinds of efforts, use the diversity that we have within those crops, and to try to build a more resilient uh, agricultural system so that, uh, as we would say in the United States, not all of our eggs are in one basket. We want to spread out the, the risks. From what you're saying then, you don't think it's a losing battle. I mean, are there not areas of Africa which are, it's going to become impossible to, to plant and cultivate crops? Well, I think there are going to be some areas of Africa that because of climate change are, are going to um, be very, very much challenged in terms of agricultural production. But is it a losing cause? Not at all. We haven't begun to take advantage of the opportunity that these opportunity crops give us. Uh, we simply haven't invested in them. They're a little bit like orphans. Uh, they have a lot of potential, um, but have suffered from years of underinvestment. So I think once we begin to do more scientific work with those crops, we'll begin to see uh, them reach that potential and, and aid people in their um, uh, struggle for food security. And in doing this work, I mean, have you found it very difficult to, to get that message across, to make people understand how they can change their methods, particularly if, if you're talking to farmers, for example, who've been doing mm -hmm. it that way for years, their, perhaps their parents did it, their grandparents did it that way, and they feel that's the way they want to carry on. Yeah. Well, not, not really. My, my experience is that farmers are inherently experimental. They like to try new things. And the types of crops that we're working with are in fact embedded in the culture. They're, they're a part of a strong cultural system. So there's a great interest in reviving that and promoting those crops, getting those <clears throat> foods into school lunch programs, for example, and more into the regular commerce. So I, I think the, um, the door is really open to this kind of progress. And where does this come from in you? Um, I mean, I talked a little bit about, uh, you know, your own personal um, involvement in food security mm -hmm. and, and the way you do things at home. Where did that come from? Where did it spring from as a, as a child, presumably? Oh, sure. I think uh, most people that spend their life on this, uh, or at least spend 30 or 40 years doing it, have some kind of emotional connection. And I, I spent summers on my grandmother's farm. Back in those days, the farm was, in modern terms, rather primitive. It was farmed by mules and by hand and not by mechanical power. So um, she wanted me to be a farmer. I couldn't quite manage that. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. It certainly sounds like you are. Anyway, thanks very much for coming in and talking to us today. Good to hear a bit about you and a bit about the program as well. It's good to be uh, slightly optimistic because we don't hear that too often when we talk Thank about you. climate change. Good to have you with us. Kerry Fowler, the U.S. government's special envoy for global food security.